What's this, an adult version of the Karate Kid? Well, sort of. It's the beginning of the training sequences for the adventure hero, Remo Williams, played by Fred Ward. And Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins, is one of four new movies we'll be reviewing this week on At The Movies, the movie review program. I'm Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. In addition to Remo Williams this week, we'll also be reviewing Twice in a Lifetime, starring Gene Hackman, Ellen Burstyn, and Anne Margaret in the story of a man who thinks he has outgrown his marriage. Also, Dim Sum, a story from San Francisco's Chinatown about a young woman who is torn between marriage and her loyalty to her mother. But first, Gene starts with the new Stephen King movie, Silver Bullet. How's this for a capsule review? Silver Bullet is laughably bad most of the time. The rest of the time, it's simply gross. When, for example, a young woman is being attacked on a bed by the werewolf and he's just clawing her bloody. Now, someday this movie may turn up on one of our guilty pleasures lists, believe it or not, of a film that's so bad, it's good, because some of the scenes in this film are hilariously bad. <laughs> but I don't know if it's going to make my guilty pleasures list, because it's so, so bad, I don't know if I could ever get to feel that it's any way good. <laughs> when, for example, did you ever expect to see, get this scene now, a priest who is a werewolf try to run down in his car a crippled child riding in a souped-up, specially equipped motorcycle? That's an astonishing scene. And how about another astonishing piece of dialogue? When a woman says to her husband, who's very scared, are you making lemonade in your pants? <laughs> that is the dialogue line that comes from the planet X, as Roger would, might, would say. <laughs> now, there's a concluding scene in the movie that occurs when two of the terrorized children in this town with the werewolf running around, along with their Uncle Red, played by the once great actor Gary Busey, are confronted by the werewolf who's lurking just outside their house. You're going to burn yourself up sometime doing that, Uncle Red. <laughs> Probably will. If that would have gone off, that would have been the end of our silver bullet. This is too much. You guys are going to bed. But Uncle Red, you said... I know what I said. But it's 10 till 3 in the morning, and it's not coming. The moon's not down yet. Well, it's damn near down. I'm going to sit up the rest of the night with a stupid gun in my lap because I promised I'd do that. But you're going to bed, and so are you. What happens if I say no? Ooh, now if I told you everything that is wrong with this movie, we wouldn't have any time left for any of the other films on this show. One, the story is not credible. Two, the characters are laughable. Three, the child's ailment is exploited. Four, people escape dangerous si situations simply through an edit to them being safe. Five, the identity of the werewolf is tipped in the first five minutes. If you can't figure out who the werewolf is, you never should go into a movie theater. <laughs> Six, there is needless and hilarious narration by the young girl there as an adult, played like she's 60 years old and only it's nine years later. <laughs> now I think I'll take a, take a breath, stop, and leave Roger to name number 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 that are wrong with this movie. Gene, I'm going to astonish you. I'm giving this movie thumbs up as a comedy. I think you totally missed the point, and I don't know why you missed the point, because I was sitting four people away from you yes. in the theater, yes. and I haven't heard you laugh harder in the last two years at a movie. Yes. I think you have to look at Silver Bullet in the same way that you look at Airplane as a satire of airport, yes. Top Secret as a satire of spy movies, this movie is such a hilarious parody of the entire Stephen King genre that in some demented way, it's a comic masterpiece. And Roger, if I could tell you, <laughs> if I could believe that, you know I'm, I felt it might be going I hope you way. do believe I'm telling I, you. That, I, I believe that you say okay. that. But I'm telling you this, that if I could have that certified in some way, that the people made this with the intention to spoof all the time, then I would say, okay, you got something there. But here's no, what I don't, I don't think, think. I don't think you need, I don't, you no, don't no, need no. a certificate because I don't think it's possible to make a movie this bad by accident. I think oh, that no. the people <laughs> who made this movie... Yeah, what about Porky's? They knew exactly what... about what, Porky's? Porky's is not this bad or this good or this funny. This movie is right down the middle of parody of the entire Stephen King thing. Uh, I think the stuff involving the kid in the wheelchair was, is not a parody. I don't think that's a parody, Roger. I think it is, and I think the fact I don't think that the, the rape... proof that it's a parody is that it's a souped-up wheelchair I think that the... goes 60 miles an I hour. I think the rape of the woman is not a parody. That is, that is very... You're, I think you're over-exaggerating that. That is a very mild scene as horror movies go, and you know that. Uh, that's a pretty rough scene. I was surprised to see well, it so early on. In that case, maybe... Let's put it this way. I, I don't even want to say let the audience decide. If you go to this one, 
It's his fault, not mine. Okay, I'll take I'll take the blame. I'll okay. take the blame. Next at the movies, Gene Hackman is a man who ends his long marriage because he's fallen in love with another woman. I got a chance. She's my chance. I'm not gonna give it up. She was named twice in a lifetime, and it begins at a 50th birthday party for a steel worker who's played by Gene Hackman. It's an upbeat party, there are a lot of presents, there's a cake there, but he seems distracted and seriously unhappy as he's surrounded by his wife and children. Later that night, he goes out for a drink with the boys and he meets the new bartender down at the corner saloon. She's played by Ann Margaret. I'd, I'd like to find that bar. And without meaning to, these two people find themselves strongly attracted to each other, Gene Hackman and Ann Margaret. Hackman feels that the life has gone out of his marriage with Ellen Burstyn. He and his wife don't have anything to talk about any longer. The kids are growing up and married or they're getting married. And this new woman, a widow, makes him feel interested in life again. Uh, you know, I'm not used to this. What? I, uh, I have been man-proof for so long. Oh, when I was with Tony, I never looked at another guy. He was real good to me. And uh, I told you he was Italian yeah. and very Latin, and he used to call me his Madonna. kept me up on this pedestal and he never let me down I, it's okay for a statue me but not for a, a woman but... yeah and then when he uh, he got sick and I I tried to make him as comfortable as possible and uh, make him feel better and everything and uh, since then I'm just putting foot in front of the other and now I'm sitting here next to you talking opening up telling you things I mean if I was 15 I could understand all this you know I, I got up this morning almost put on five ties put it on and take it off put it on and take it off I felt like a kid that's the way I wanted to please Hackman's wife, played by Ellen Burstyn, is shocked by the news that he wants to end their marriage to give himself another chance in life. What about me? Don't I deserve a chance? I mean, what about feelings? Kate, I feel and I care. But do you love me? Sure I do. But it's different, it's just... She's new. Younger than me. She's not younger. She just thinks she's younger, that's all. She looks at me like I'm here. Like I'm not part of the stinking wallpaper. I don't look at you like that. Oh, look at us, look at us. We've got nothing for each other. We've got nothing going, nothing happening for each other. We're here because this is where we've been put. If Twice in a Lifetime were a run-of-the-mill movie, it'd be easy for us to predict all the developments. Anne Margaret would be portrayed as the evil other woman, and Ellen Burstyn would be the martyred heroine, and Gene Hackman would be the creep who has abandoned his family. And that is, in fact, exactly the way that Hackman's oldest daughter wants to interpret the situation in this movie. She's played by Amy Madigan in a wonderful performance that mm -hmm. combines anger against her dad with love for a younger sister who seems to be rushing into marriage. But twice in a lifetime is not predictable. It argues that both of these people had come to a dead end in their lives together and that maybe it was time for both of them to start growing again. The way this movie avoids the soap opera cliches about adultery is impressive. The performances are good, and this is one of the more sensitive and perceptive movies of the year, even though it's not a perfect movie. It has some ragged ends and inconsistencies that we could probably point out. If we Which I'll to. now do, oh, okay. uh, although I like the film. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing I think that the uh, Ellen Burstyn character is the poorly the, the worst character in the film in terms of its writing and its depth mm -hmm. she is we have not seen the justification for gene hackman's speech that she looked at him only as wallpaper mm -hmm. i think we see clues early on that she is interested in him and trying to make contact and he's more culpable than she is i'm mm -hmm. talking about not the way the movie would like to think about it i'm talking about what's up on the screen yeah. i think that's a flaw in the film mm -hmm. i also think it's a little predictable in how it sets up 
their eventual break. We can see it coming, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes ahead of time. At the same time, I think you hit the key to the film, the Amy Madigan character. Mm -hmm. Her outrage and the children always are the ones that are broken yeah. just as much as the parents in these things. Her outrage just rings as true. It's a fabulous performance for, by her, as well as Heckman mm -hmm. and Margaret. But that's what I love And I'll so tell much. you the scene where she pulls it off because she's the central actress in this scene. She and her mother go into the bar where Hackman is sitting you, there. Oh, and it's Aunt a Margaret. great scene. That scene could have been so bad. Right. It could have been so cliched. It could have been so melodramatic. And it's played exactly for the right note all the way through. All the pain is there. Yeah. All the truth is there. Here's a, here's a case, scene. really, where a supporting actress, I think, really she saves the movie. She pulls the threads together. She saves right. the movie. Mm -hmm. Coming up next at the movies, Remo Williams, a man who goes to great lengths and great heights to get his job done. Audacity to advertise itself as a series, even though it's the first film in what the producers hope will be a series. <laughs> but despite their arrogance, I think there is a chance there might be another Remo Williams film. I like the character, and I like his Korean cohort. This is sort of an adult version of The Karate Kid, with Fred Ward being trained by a super secret government agency to kill an evil businessman, a rotten defense contractor. And his trainer, played by Joel Gray, is an expert in the martial arts. Place your hands behind your head. I did not say keep them there. Your reflexes are pitiful. The seasons move faster. No doubt the result of all that filthy poison you have been stuffing into your belly. Do you know why Americans call it fast food? Because it speeds them on the way to the grave. <laughs> He's got some funny dialogue. Now, in one of the film's most exciting sequences, Remo does battle with the bad guy's thugs on the scaffolding of the Statue of Liberty. Great special effects here. great stuff. But the toughest henchman is a dude named Stone, who has a diamond in one of his teeth that Remo uses to his advantage when he and a military friend are trapped in a gas chamber. That's for my friends at the statue. This one's for me. I love that scene. A lot of guys who do break and entering jobs are going to want to have diamonds installed in their teeth. Think what that's going to do for the dentistry industry. <laughs> a diamond. Well, that'll be $8,000, please, plus, uh, you know, charge for the cleaning of the tooth. <laughs> the woman character we saw there is an embarrassment in this film. She's a military major. I don't know why she has to be played as a nitwit. And I was very surprised to see that this movie is about just Remo's long, drawn-out attempt to knock off just one bad guy. I think it would have been a much better film if he had handled, say, three cases in this one film. The bad guy in this guy, the rotten defense contractor, doesn't seem to be evil enough for a whole movie. 
But despite those criticisms, Fred Ward is realistically gruff as Remo, and Joel Gray is superb. It is impossible, I think, to recognize him as the master instructor known as Chun. And special effects, mm -hmm. we talked about the James Bond films, how they've all gone downhill, this maybe. This is great. And you know who did it? Guy Hamilton, who did some of the early James That's Bond right. films. That's right. This whole movie must have been shot by people wearing parachutes because... Uh, it is it fabulous in that way. The, there's a scene in a logging camp where he rides down a log that's high right. above the forest and they're shooting at him with a machine So guns. did you like it too? This scene with the Statue of Liberty, fabulous. I give it a near miss though, Gene. I can't believe I'll this. I'll tell you why. I think it's too long. It takes too long to end. It should have been compressed. It's a great idea, a good character, fabulous stunts. It just needed to be boiled down a little bit. It's just too strung out. And this is the man, ladies and gentlemen, who gives a yes to Silver Bullet and thumbs down to this fine movie, Remo Williams. And I stand behind both of those votes, and I would be happy to meet you after the show and help you a little bit you with your you uh, film reasoning. And I recommend that you stand well behind both of those votes. Next at the <laughs> movies, in Chinese, Dim Sum means a little piece of the heart. And the movie Dim Sum is about the hearts of its Chinese characters. You know, Chinese men are real dead woods when they marry to Chinese women. All they care about is their sons and which movies to Betamax. A small, warm-hearted treasure named Dim Sum that tells the story of a Chinese-American family in San Francisco that's making the transition from the traditional values of the older generation to the more contemporary American middle-class orientation of the kids. The movie is mostly told from the point of view of the last daughter who is still living at home. She's about 30, she has a boyfriend who wants to marry her, but she feels she should stay with her mother. And what does the mother think? Well, she says she wants her daughter to get married. She's sad that her daughter hasn't gotten mm. married, but there are hints that maybe she likes the status quo. Here's a scene where the family is gathered around the family dining table. This is what Uncle Tam, I saw the movie You Can't Take It With You last night with Jimmy Stewart. Oh, what a wonderful movie that was. Yeah, that was pretty good. Oh. Gushy. Not a bit. Oh, so wonderful. It was part. Lionel Barrymore, the father, and Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, uh, so. Gene Arthur and Faye Painter. What a wonderful family it was. I mean, well, people were so laughing and, and, and hugging each other and loving each other. Because, you liked it? Yeah, because in Chinatown, life wasn't like that. It just opened my eyes. It's like a, a duck, you know, when you peck out of, of the shell. The first thing you see is against his mother. Mm -hmm. My mother was the movies. <laughs> oh, but the older folks like your father, you know, they never went to the movie. They didn't know well, what they can't going. understand the language. Well, they just never went there. So when we went there, we just, you know, looked into the movies. And American the, culture oh, for the people. Saw something for the first time. Happy birthday to me. Should I blow it out? Yeah, make a wish. Make a wish. Oh, make a wish. Okay. The avuncular old family friend there, played by Victor Wong, is one of my favorite characters in this movie. He wants to marry the mother, but he can't do that until the daughter moves out, and so everybody seems to be waiting on everybody else. Dim Sum is a movie without a lot of plot. It's about a few weeks in the lives of these people, and what's special about it is how clearly the film sees what they're like, what their weaknesses are, how they're sometimes blocking their own happiness. Oh, I think you hit it right there, blocking their own happiness. Because yeah. uh, the film is a lot of fun, and that sequence had a little joy in it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's a very sad film in this way. We see that the daughter's life is being foreshortened by her fidelity to her mother. Mm -hmm. Honorable, yes, and traditional in that culture, yes. yes mm -hmm. But the life is being shortened. She's going to be hurt by that. The father, the, I mean, the Uncle Tam. The uncle. His life is being cut short, and the mothers indeed, they would have a terrific life together. Mm -hmm. It's time, maybe, this film is saying, for everybody to grow up. Maybe the uh, Western culture isn't all bad. Maybe they can adopt some of that. That's represented by the movie. I think this film is admirable. Wayne Wayne, who made this, is really challenging his own culture in uh -huh. some way, and I admire him for doing well, that. Well, this, of course, Wayne Wang is the man who made Chan is Missing, yeah. a wonderful, very low-budget film from a couple of years ago. Now right. he has more money, he's able to shoot in color, he has a more ambitious plot. What's fascinating, Gene, is how in a movie like this, we're able to see an entire chapter of American culture that isn't represented in the movies or on television right. until somebody like Wang comes along and says, these are my people, I know them pretty well, I want you to look at them too. And he doesn't do the old gimmick, which is, they're my people, and so I'm going to present to them in the most noble way possible. Yeah. These are people with flaws and with a lot of great that's character. Right. Mm -hmm. Now that's it for this week. Let's review our reactions to the films on this show. You may recall that we both laughed 
at the Stephen King thriller Silver Bullet. Roger, however, was laughing with the film. I was laughing at the film. A split vote, thumbs up, thumbs down. Now we had a split only in the degree to which we liked twice in a lifetime. Both thumbs up, but Roger enjoyed it more than I did. For me, I thought Amy Madigan's performance as the outrageous daughter was the best part of this somewhat overwritten film. And we split now on Remo Williams. I enjoyed it much more than Roger. Roger felt a near miss. I thought the action scenes were spectacular. Finally, two thumbs up for Dim Sun, an affecting tale of how honoring one's mother possibly can cripple the children. So if you listen to both of us, you go to a all lot of four pictures. movies this week, and if you listen to one of the others of us, you wouldn't go to three of them. That's I think my math is right. You need an abacus. Uh, I'll try. That's it for this week. Next week at the movies, reviews of Eleni with John Malkovich and Kate Nelligan and the story of a man's search for the truth about his mother's death. And William Friedkin's new thriller, To Live and Die in L.A., with a secret service on the track of counterfeiters. That's next week, and until then, we'll see you at the movies. Thank you.